Some of their core beliefs are that government is the negation of liberty, that respect for the individual's property is fundamental to a peaceful society, that violent action is only warranted in defense of one's property, and that the individual owns his or her body and is therefore responsible for his or her actions. Tonight we are hosting a speech on the founding values of our nation, how those values found their way into our most important historical documents, and how those values still guide us today. We have invited Michael J. Knowles, a New York Times bestselling author and host of his own podcast, to speak with us on the importance of these values. If you have brought his book with you, I invite you, I invite you to stay after the event is concluded, as Michael will be doing a book signing. His book is not being sold at this event. There will be a question and answer session following the end of Michael's speech. Because of this, we ask that you keep your comments and questions until that time. Before we begin, I would like to take this time to remind all guests of the Ithaca College rules for the maintenance of public order. Article 3, Section 1 of this policy states that intentional disruption or, destruct or obstruction of teaching, guest lectures, research, administration, free movement, disciplinary proceedings, or other college activities may result in disciplinary action. We ask all our guests to be as respectful as possible throughout the duration of the event. Please do not block someone else's view of the stage, and please stay seated, un please stay seated un during the event, unless, of course, you need to use the restroom or just leave. Without further delay, I'd like to welcome Michael J. Knowles to begin his very important talk on the founding values of our nation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, very much. Thank you for coming out. I, d I didn't know that my talk would be so controversial, but I'm pleased to hear it. Uh, it's very funny because the main thing that I have ever done is not write a book. So I, I, didn't, I did a talk at Yeshiva University on Monday uh, where I talked about the humorless left, how the, the right is having such a good time right now, and we're laughing and we're having a good time. And the left is shrieking and yelling and wearing hats in the shape of genitals and just not having a very good time. And they look like, do you, I don't know if you've ever seen that meme of Sandra Fluke. Sandra Fluke was this Democrat activist, and she's kind of, her arms are crossed, and she's frowning and says, that's not funny, that's not funny. That's the left right now. And, Anyone who would protest a blank book is protesting nothing, first of all, and, and second of all, seems to have validated my theory. But we will not talk about nothing tonight. We will use words. We will use words that uh, we're not supposed to use. We're not supposed to talk about these things at the dinner table. The topic of discussion is, give me that old time religion, America's Christian foundation. We're talking about politics and religion, and that's a big no-no. That is, a, you're not supposed to do that, and, which I've never understood. If you, you know, you're not supposed to talk about politics or religion at the dinner table, but what does that leave you to talk about? That leaves you to talk about the chicken. That leaves you to say, oh, do you like, you like the chicken like this? And I like, okay, that's nice, you know. But is that all we can talk about? It's just small talk? That's so, that's so uh, shallow. That's, uh, we would think that we could talk about uh, more than that, that the level of discourse could be a little raised. And nobody enjoys small talk. It's very awkward and it's very tedious. There was a study out of the University of Arizona in 2010 that showed that people hate small talk and they like talking about things that matter. The lead psychology on that study observed, by engaging in meaningful conversations, we manage to impose meaning on an otherwise pretty chaotic world. And interpersonally, as you find this meaning, you bond with your partner and we know that interpersonal connection and integration is a core foundation of happiness. Meaning, order, chaos. That Jordan Peterson has just sold about a zillion books and taken over YouTube by talking about this very subject. And you don't need to talk to Jordan Peterson or any other psychologist to tell you how terrible small talk is. It is just awful. So it seems that you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't. If you discuss meaningful things, then you're rude. And if you just discuss frivolous things and the chicken at dinner table, you'll be miserable. Now, of course, those aren't the only options for conversation. It isn't just Leviticus or the weather. That would be a very stark contrast. You can also talk about baseball games or Netflix or how delicious Tide Pods have become all of a sudden. You can, <laughs> you can talk about the culture, in other words. And that is our culture in 2018. We were promised flying cars and we're eating laundry detergent. That's what we've become. <laughs> but culture doesn't let us off the hook so easily. Andrew Breitbart was fond of observing Politics is downstream of culture. 
Our culture dictates our politics. Donald Trump was not elected president because of his great record of statesmanship and political achievement. He was elected president because he's a pop culture superstar. Barack Obama, the same thing. Barack Obama didn't have any political accomplishments to his name before he announced his bid for president. He missed most of his votes in the Illinois State Senate, and he had served in the U.S. Senate for just two years before he announced his run. He was a cultural figure, hope and change. And he also positioned himself as a religious figure, as a messianic figure. During his 2008 announcement, Obama announced, I face this challenge with profound humility and knowledge of my own limitations, but... And when, this is a usage note, when people say but, that negates the sentence. <laughs> so if you say, I'm, I'm very humble, but let me tell you about how, what a cool guy I am. They always negate sentences. You hear this on college campuses all the time. People say, I support free speech, but you mm -mm -mm, get you conservatives off of campus. You, you hear politicians say, I support the Second Amendment, but I want to take all of your guns. You hear uh, boyfriends and girlfriends say this. I'm really, really sorry, but, and that means I'm not sorry at all and you're <laughs> acting crazy, that's what that means. A slight digression on the buttheads. In 2008, in 2008, Barack Obama announced, if we are willing to work for it and fight for it and believe in it, then I am absolutely certain that generations from now, we are going to be able to look back and tell our children, this was the moment we began to provide care for the sick and jobs for the jobless. This was the moment when the rise of the oceans began to slow and our planet began to heal. And that does not sound like politics, does it? That doesn't even sound like culture. Barack Obama promised, if you believe in me, I will heal the sick and calm the oceans. There, there is a man who did all of those things. It's in a wonderful book that you should read. His name was not Barack Obama. They call Donald Trump a narcissist. They call him a narcissist. Donald Trump has never promised to calm the oceans. Politics is downstream of culture, and culture is downstream of religion. That's built into the word culture itself. Culture and cult come from the same word. What a culture worships is going to define it. So a culture that worships money is going to be materialistic. A culture that worships sex is going to be licentious. Our culture worships both. That's not so bad some of the time. But, uh, but in general, broadly, in the long run, that's probably not a great thing. The left would have us pretend that all religions are equal, except for Christianity, of course, which is terrible. But all of them are equal, except for that little uh, side note. They're all the same. They all worship the same God. The God of Christianity, the God of Islam, it's all the same God. Even the Buddhists and the Hindus, it's just all the same thing, isn't it? But of course, this isn't the case. If this were the case, then we wouldn't have different religions. If, if Christianity were no different than Islam, we wouldn't have a religion called Islam. Christianity came first, something changed, there was a new thing, and then we got Islam. Uh, this is where history helps. Our friends on the left may be frequently wrong, but they're never in doubt. <laughs> so let's clear up some religious history. And then we can see how all of this affects America's past and present and future. Uh, on the question of Islam, Islam was founded in the seventh century by an Arab named Muhammad who joined his uncle Abu Talib on a merchant trip to Syria. On that trip, he met a heretical Christian monk named Bahira, and shortly thereafter, he laid the groundwork for his religious vision. This is the basis of Islam. Now, even just saying the word Islam, even just discussing it, I am waiting for the doors to be knocked down and Antifa to come and club me over the head, even to bring up this thing. And that is because the left confuses two entirely different concepts, race and religion. Lefties seem to think that certain countries and certain peoples just naturally belong to some religion or another. So therefore, to criticize one religion or to even discuss it is racist because there would be the same thing. But of course, this isn't the case. On my show last week, I interviewed a Lebanese Christian woman named Brigitte Gabriel. Uh, she was born in Lebanon. She lived her childhood during the Lebanese Civil War. She saw most of her friends, uh, many of her friends and family killed or attacked by uh, Muslim belligerents during that war. She was only saved when Christian missionaries entered her town and the Israeli army invaded and gave them life-saving medical support. Same country, same race of people, different religious premises, different culture, a different life, different government, different life. Syria today is a Muslim country. Before Muhammad's religious movement and military campaigns, Syria was an important Christian country. The Apostle Paul was converted on the road to Damascus. 
Uh, only in the decade after Muhammad's death was Syria captured by Muslim Arabs of the Rashidun army, which established the Umayyad dynasty. We see the horrors on television coming out of Syria nightly. How might that country have developed differently had the Byzantine Empire resisted Khalid ibn al-Walid's invasion in the seventh century? Religion defines culture, culture defines politics. Different religions create different cultures, and those cultures govern themselves differently. So how might our culture in the West have developed differently had Muslim invaders in the seventh and eighth centuries succeeded in conquering Europe? The Umayyad Caliphate was not content just to hang around Syria, and frankly, I don't blame them. In fairness, if I had the choice between Syria or Paris, I would choose Paris. It's a very nice city. The Umayyad armies agreed. Within just 100 years of the death of Muhammad, the Umayyad Caliphate nearly conquered Europe. By the year 711, it invaded and started toppling Visigothic Christian kingdoms of the Iberian Peninsula. By 732, they made it to Tours. Now, you know, our friends on the left, including Barack Obama, they love to apologize for uh, the rest of us for imagined Western aggression against the rest of the world at all times, hundreds of years ago. Do you remember Barack Obama's apology tour? During his presidency, Barack Obama, who knows absolutely nothing about the Crusades, excused Islamic terror today by pointing to the Crusades, a defensive war that took place 900 years ago, which is really reaching. That's quite, quite far back. If only he'd looked four centuries earlier than that to the Battle of Tours, which took place not 150 miles outside of Mecca, but 150 miles outside of Paris, right in the heart of Europe. The Battle of Tours was a turning point in the history of the West, religious, cultural, and political. Led by Charles Martel, Christian forces turned away the far larger Muslim forces, killed their leader, and stopped the Muslim advance into Europe. Now, this wasn't the last time that Muslim forces would try to invade Europe. In 1571, the Ottoman Empire aggressed in the Mediterranean. Christian fleets flying the banners of Christ crucified and Our Lady of Guadalupe sailed to meet the Ottomans off the western coast of Greece. The Ottomans flew a 16-foot-long silk, uh, silk banner rather, of their admiral, Quranic verses, and the name of Allah stitched in gold nearly 30,000 times. They also flew the Zulfikar, the double-bladed sword that Muhammad is said to have used during his military campaigns. Just those images should dispel any silly notions that all religions are the same and would produce the same culture and would produce the same politics. Fortunately for us, and despite long odds, the Christian forces prevailed. Again in 1683, the Ottoman Turks tried to conquer Europe at the Battle of Vienna. That wasn't 900 years ago either, if Barack Obama happens to be watching. I hope he is. I, know he, I think he watches the show every day. Uh, less than 100 years before the American Revolution, less than 100 years before, Muslim invaders attempted to conquer Vienna. And fortunately for all of us, the vastly outnumbered Holy Roman Empire defeated the invaders. This brings, I hope you can appreciate that we've just gone through 1,400 years of history in about seven minutes. This brings us to the American Revolution, because this is the topic that we are discussing tonight. America's Christian Foundation. Very politically incorrect. How might a different end to all of those battles have changed our revolution, our culture, our government, our way of life? Uh, Father George Rutler puts this issue into stark light. He writes, had the Christian fleet sunk off Western Greece on October 7th in 1571, we would not be here now. These words would not be written in English. There would be no universities. Human rights, holy matrimony, advanced science, enfranchised women, fair justice, and morality as it was carved on the tablets of Moses and enfleshed in Christ. Without a Christian foundation, there would be no United States of America. Christianity had existed in England, which gives us our language and our legal system, since at least the third century. The university developed out of the European cathedral schools, specifically the University of Paris and the University of Bologna and the University of Oxford, which sprang up alongside it. Human rights, which our friends on the left love to talk about. They're always talking about human rights. They name things that are entirely, entirely unrelated. They call them the human rights campaign and the human rights this and the human rights that. They are discussed constantly, usually incoherently. Those derive from natural rights, as in, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. Those derive from the natural law, as described by St. Thomas Aquinas, and the natural law comes to us from that eternal metaphysical lawgiver, that big Jewish guy in the sky. Only cultures shaped by Christianity, 
Uh, only in those cultures do we see the abolition of slavery or any notion of women's rights, beginning with the spiritual equality of men and women in holy matrimony, extending all the way to the right to vote. Slavery, as well as the subjugation of women, run rampant today throughout cultures that have resisted Christian influence, including widespread approval for honor killings of women in Asia and the Middle East. Our conceptions of liberty, which Americans hold so dear, owe entirely to the culture that says, if the sun sets you free, you will be free indeed. Christianity preaches grace and liberty, God's love and grace, and crucially, our free will to turn toward him. Christianity teaches that God is the logos, the divine logic of the universe, which becomes flesh and dwells among us. Other religions teach that God is not constrained to logic, but may deal in senseless wrath. They teach not liberty, but submission. One religion means submission. Americans do not submit. Americans love liberty. Why? Because the United States has developed within a certain culture, and that culture worships a particular god. If the founders of our nation worshipped a different god, we would have developed a different kind of culture, and we would live under a different kind of government in a different kind of society. Nevertheless, nevertheless, she persisted, nevertheless, our lightly educated friends on the left, they insist that America is not a Christian nation. They point to slogans and catchphrases, such as the separation of church and state. Uh, the favorite line that they point to when they describe the separation of church and state is John Adams who says, allegedly who says, the government of the United States of America is not in any sense founded on the Christian religion. You see this in memes that go around the social media. As Mark Twain put it, it's not what we don't know that gets us in trouble, it's what we know for certain that just ain't so. That line that I've just quoted comes from the Treaty of Tripoli, which was ratified by the Senate and signed by John Adams. But our friends on the left should probably not be so fast to point to the Treaty of Tripoli as evidence of America's multicultural, anti-Christian foundation. The Treaty of Tripoli was only signed because in the earliest days of our nation, pirates from Morocco, Tunis, Algiers, and Tripoli began kidnapping American sailors in the Mediterranean and selling them into slavery, forcing the United States to the bargaining table. As, as you can imagine, I'd go running to the bargaining table if my countrymen were being enslaved. The Barbary powers declared that they were at war with all Christian nations. As a result, in diplomatic communications with these states, Americans would say that they had nothing against Muslims and in this one case that America was not a Christian nation because the business of America is business and they got to keep that trade going. It's very hard to blame them if you are a Christian nation and you want to conduct your trade without your people being sold into slavery. You might get a little mealy-mouthed with your language. But to the extent that John Adams or other early president reached out to Muslims, it was always for the same reason, to obtain agreements for trade uh, and to protect ships that were being attacked in the Mediterranean. So there goes that line of argument. Okay, but what about the First Amendment? What about the Establishment Clause, which reads, Congress shall make no law establishing, respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Now our lefty friends, they point to this, they say, aha, I've got it. This is the irrefutable proof of the separation of church and state. They do have a point. The First Amendment does offer some separation between church and state, but the purpose of that separation is to protect the church from the state, not the other way around, not to protect the state from the church. The left would have us believe that the framers of the Constitution considered religion a threat to our civic culture, and so they, they had to secularize it and ground governments strictly on reason, on neutral reason, rather than all of those awful superstitions and dangers of religion. Even a cursory glance at the historical and philosophical evidence shows that this left-wing secular narrative is impossible. While the First Amendment prohibited the federal establishment of religion, roughly half of the states at the time had some form of religious establishment when that document was ratified. Other states were pursuing it as well. Did all of those states just ratify themselves into unconstitutionality? Probably not. Founders and framers, all the way up to and including George Washington, John Adams, Patrick Henry, uh, Supreme Court Justice John Marshall, all of them supported some degree of established religion in the United States. John Adams put it bluntest of all, our Constitution was made for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. That's, John, that's the same John Adams that they say said America is not a Christian country. But that he, he, when he said that, it was in a treaty. He wasn't texting it to his buddies or something. He made that line quite clear. That's John Adams. So why were so many of our founding fathers insistent on this point of religion? It's because freedom is dangerous. 
Society requires order. Either the people can order themselves or a powerful government will order you for you. Just watch out. Liberty is a risky thing and it cannot be entrusted to just anybody. People who cannot control themselves are not fit for liberty. Liberty will die out in an instant, as we've seen so frequently occur when liberal government is foisted on cultures that cannot sustain it. The Christian religion, simply as the founders understood, is conducive to the formation of virtue, which in turn sustains a free republic and allows that form of government to survive and to thrive. Now, of course, America's foundation goes back further than just 1776. Christopher Columbus, the discoverer of the Americas, was a devout Catholic. He pray, uh, prayed constantly on the voyage from Spain. He made a confession and he took a Eucharist before he left in the morning. He set his book of hours privately in his own cabin. He instructed the youngest sailors to lead prayer every half hour on the half hour. And he ended each day of sailing with a ship-wide recitation of the Our Father, Hail Mary, Apostles' Creed, and Hail Holy Queen. The Mayflower passengers who founded New England were Christian zealots, I think it's fair to say. I descend from four of them. I actually only descend from one pilgrim and then three so-called strangers who were true derelicts. I've recently learned, I looked into the history of this, they were mutineers and thieves and murderers. <laughs> My uh, great-great-grandfather, John Billington, was the first person in America to be executed for murder. So that's the, but one of them was a pilgrim, Christian zealots. And consider the circumstances of their arrival. The pilgrims make it here. The Mayflower makes it here. They are blown 300 miles, hundreds of miles, off of their intended landing point in Manhattan. They don't even land at the next biggest harbor. They land in this kind of middle ground. They finally settle on this place at Plymouth. They get out of their ships, and there are perfectly cultivated fields. There are perfectly cultivated fields. There are stores of corn. And there is nobody there. There are dry bones because the inhabitants had been wiped out in a plague just before the pilgrims' arrival. Then they're thinking, well, this is a pretty weird coincidence. Probably we have the right religion. And as they say that, Squanto walks out of the woods, the only person in the hemisphere to speak fluent English because by a strange coincidence, he had been kidnapped, brought to Spain, freed by monks, brought to London, hung out in London for a while, made it back to America, walked down the coast, and just miraculously walked out at the exact place where the pilgrims were not supposed to land. That seems like more of a coincidence than I'm willing to accept. Providential, you might even say. Our Declaration of Independence reads, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights. To which creator do they refer? They refer to the Christian God, of course, who I should note also happens to be a Jew, hence the popular phrase Judeo-Christian. He is the creator that they all recognized and worshiped. That line alone should dispel any absurd modern notion that America's founding was somehow atheistic or, to use the modern phrase, secular. It says creator right in the document. Now, one should acknowledge the variety of Christian belief in America and in the founding. This will bring us back to the title of the discussion, that old time religion. Give me that old time religion, not the modern religion, not the new religion, the old time religion, which is good enough for me. There was a variety of Christian thought at that founding. I'm sure the Mayflower ancestors of mine would be shocked and appalled and horrified by the flagrant popery of their offspring. The settlers of New England banished religious dissenters of various stripes, including poor Ann Hutchinson, who became the first American, though not the last American, to be murdered in the Bronx. She would have a long line of people after her. She was murdered there by Indians, and all she got was a lousy parkway. Maryland was founded as a Catholic colony, Maryland. Uh, the Quakers flocked to Pennsylvania. The Pilgrims splintered into ever more narrow sects, Congregationalists and Baptists and Anabaptists and Methodists and so on. Some of our founders and framers even espoused an abstract deism, which denied various doctrines of the Christian creed, but institutionally preserved most of what Christendom had bestowed upon the West. It is this abstraction and vagueness that I would like to warn against, both in politics and in religion. From the Enlightenment onward, there has existed a rationalist tendency to abstract ideas from the institutions that support them. You hear this all the time in politics. You heard this during the 2016 presidential campaign, especially among your conservative and libertarian friends. They say, so-and-so is not a true conservative. Capital T, capital C, little trademark sign at the top. He's not a true conservative. He doesn't stand for liberty. He doesn't stand for equality or for, because they're always standing. They only stand, they don't do anything, they just stand there. 
They, it's very frustrating. The Republican presidential candidate in 2012, Tim Pawlenty, his slogan, bless his heart, he's a very nice guy, his slogan was, the courage to stand which doesn't require any courage. There is no courage that is required to stand. Most people can do it just fine. This is why left-wing activism is so sad these days, too, because they all just kind of loaf. They just, they occupy Wall Street. They don't even look, knock down the buildings or throw rock. They just occupy. They just sit there. What do we want? I don't know. When do we want it? Uh, that's basically left-wing activism in 2018. All value, <laughs> lest I haven't made this point clear enough, all value is enfleshed. All virtues must be enacted in time and space by people with bodies. The principles for which our abstracting friends so courageously stand are utterly useless if they are not put into practice by real and therefore imperfect men through effort and institutions. There is a new search for meaning all around us. It is in the air. You can feel it happening. The dominant leftist worldview just does not cut it. It's why everybody is so agitated. They, and they, I got, I saw before this event happened, someone wrote on a poster or something. They said, I don't know who this guy is, but I hate him. I, that, that sums it up. Everybody's really on edge, especially the left. They're very on edge, aren't they? There is a crisis and a, a hunger for meaning. Uh, the, the prevailing moral framework, a leftist framework that says, if it feels good, do it. That isn't gratifying. It's gratifying for a little while, then it's not gratifying anymore. The atheist vision that life is a tragedy, that all of our hopes and all of our dreams and all of our joys are really just illusions produced by chemicals in our brains that just delude us into forgetting that we're all going to die and turn to worm food. That doesn't cut it. The idea that uh, this life is a tale told by an idiot full of sound and fury signifying nothing. It doesn't cut it. And we all suspect deep down that it just isn't true. Viktor Frankl, the Holocaust survivor of Auschwitz, knew this when he wrote, man's search for meaning is the primary motivation in his life and not a secondary rationalization of intellectual drives, instinctual drives, pardon. That's why books like Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life have skyrocketed up the bestseller charts. How a boring, quiet, mild-mannered, a professor in Canada has become a global superstar is because he is speaking precisely to this problem. This is why simple declarations that objective truth exists, that there are only two biological sexes, that facts indeed do not care about your feelings. This is how they have become the most viral clips on YouTube. The insipid, emotivist, relativistic tyranny of feelings that has defined public discourse for decades is crumbling under the weight of its own incoherence. Now, right-minded, truth-seeking people have a great challenge before us, which will require real courage, not the courage to stand. That courage is fairly minimal. It will require real courage. <laughs> Most of us can stand. We must have the courage to follow this search for meaning to its logical conclusions. Politics sits downstream of culture, and culture is downstream of the god or gods our society worships. The culture that built the United States over 400 years worshiped the triune god of Christianity. Our politics has decayed because our culture has decayed. And our culture has decayed because the new gods that it worships cannot sustain the greatest, freest, most charitable, most prosperous country in the history of the world. They cannot sustain our liberty. This is not a threat. This is an observation. Those gods cannot sustain our liberty. Our country is built for a moral and religious people. An immoral and irreligious people cannot be trusted with American liberty. Many prominent progressives today, Sam Harris comes to mind, they deny even free will. Existence, they say, it's just a matter of random atoms sort of smashing together. It's a senseless cosmic accident. There's no divine logic to the universe. There's no eternal reason. There's no heavenly liberator. But if there's no free will, then there's no freedom. If there's no free will, then there's no freedom at all. What does freedom even mean if there's no free will? Liberty is an illusion. Bring on the tyranny. What's the difference? And you can sense this happening around. People might not be articulating this, but certainly we see it happening. The great Catholic writer, Hilaire Belloc, predicted all of this as early as 1931. He predicted that this sort of new paganism would produce a mass of restrictive legislation on action and on speech that it would, with greater and greater confidence, oppose human dignity, sterilize the unfit, restrict birth, 
that it would institute a new form of slavery, the compulsion of labor backed by the arms of the state. Does any of that sound familiar? Today, there are so many federal regulations on the books that nobody knows how many there are. I Googled it before the speech when I was putting it together. I said, I wonder how many federal regulations. There is no number that anyone can come up with. The Congressional Research Service cannot give an answer. That is too many regulations. A million babies are killed in the womb each year. Bakers and florists are being hauled into court for declining to participate in certain ceremonies. We must have the courage to follow our search for meaning to its logical conclusions. We cannot merely stand for principles, whatever that means. We cannot merely fight the left. We cannot merely even patronize good art or make good movies or watch good television shows or cook up good Tide Pods. Of course, all of these things are important. And, and salty, delicious leftist tears are wonderful. We should drink deep of that frothy ambrosia. But we should also contain them in the proper vessel. And, and we must not content ourselves with merely making our beds and cleaning our rooms. We must not merely intellectualize or think or say, well, I don't believe myself, but you know, I think that religious doctrine is good for society, and so I'll just pretend because you know, it might be good for my psychological state or for my culture. That's not good enough. We must not even merely believe. We must not content ourselves with merely the metaphysical and the metaphorical, the abstraction and the rationalization. We are people with bodies in time and space. We must not merely defend ideas, but participate in those traditions and those institutions and those sacraments that join the metaphysical and the physical, the signifier and the signified, heaven and earth. Politics sits downstream of culture, and culture sits downstream of the gods that culture worships. We must worship, truly worship, on our knees with our whole, whole selves and with that old time religion, the God who has blessed our country and who made America great in the first place and who can make America great again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael, for that really great and educational speech. We will now begin our Q&A session. Out of respect for everyone's time, uh, I ask that no questions be longer than 15 seconds, and there will be no follow-up questions. Please, t uh, You can please line up over there, and mic handlers will give you a mic. Thank you. Over here. I think they're just there. I'm holding the mic. Either way. I'll hold it. Can you take this away? Yeah, can line up over there. Can you take this away? Thank you. You good? You have a question? Yeah. Ready? Yep. Okay. Oh, okay. I just lean here. Uh, would you say that um, religion is really uh, something that just kind of appears out of the blue? Or would you say that religion is something that rather reflects the views of a people? Like, like I think that Islam is something that, you know, kind of just reflects the general views of the region rather than just a religion that like, boom, appeared. Well, we, you know. and certainly religions do reflect on people. Really, it reflects on God. So the people reflect more on the religion than the religion reflects upon the people. But in the case of Islam, for instance, it, it did have a starting point. We do know the starting point. It was a man who did it, and uh, it happened in a certain year, and it happened after he talked to another guy from another religion. And so it certainly did have that. I think there's a very modern notion that religion, you know, it's really just about the feels, man. And, you know, like they do this thing, they say, I'm spiritual, but I'm not religious, which really means I really think that I'm interesting, but uh, I don't care that much about God or anything else. That's basically what that phrase means. That, I think, is implicit in your question. I think that uh, people of faith are reflecting on something outside of themselves. And part of the crisis that we're in right now in the search for meaning is we're realizing that just looking into ourselves, make your own meaning, self-love. My favorite website on the entire internet is Everyday Feminism. And I'm, <laughs> I'm fairly convinced that it is a right-wing satire website. Uh, but either way, I thank them for that, uh, that resource. And they have a, a portion of the site that says, 
Uh, this is your self-love course. We have to love ourselves. But of course, if we love ourselves, we're going to be uh, empty. We're going to be unsatisfied. A man wrapped up in himself makes a very small package indeed. But a man who loves a, a God, especially a God who loves him back, is, is more fulfilled. And I think the only way to do that is not to look at we the people, but for all of we the people to join in and look at God uh, together. Uh, do you mind if I ask a nope. quick? No, no follow-up. Oh, Sorry. Yeah. Okay. That, <laughs> that was the question. Can I ask another question? No. Okay. <laughs> so uh, with the loss of religion in our society, we've seen sort of a creep of postmodernism in our society and the replacement of enlightenment values and even the notion of objective truth. So with this being said, you know, people like Dennis Prager have talked about how there can't really be objective morality or objective truth without faith and certainly the move away from enlightenment values uh, coinciding with this would point to that. Do you think that's true or do you believe that we can have a return to the enlightenment and objective reality, for lack of a better term, without a return to religion? I think we have to go a little further back than the enlightenment because I think much of the enlightenment, you can't talk about the enlightenment broadly because there were, di there were different thinkers and there were different things that came out, worked out a little better in the UK than in France, for instance, where everyone just got their heads chopped off in the name of equality. <laughs> everyone had them equally chopped off. Um, but I think you have to go back a little further because much of the project of the enlightenment was separating the values that we all hold dear from the God that created those values and that promotes those values. So uh, I agree with my cigar buddy Dennis on virtually everything. But I'm a little more hopeful because what I'm looking at right now is not the decline of religion in society. That might be reflected in certain public opinion polls or something. I see, I see Jordan Peterson skyrocketing up YouTube and I think that there's a whole generation of people that were raised without any sort of religion in this awful, boring, depressing malaise of postmodern, you, you, you do you, man, don't yuck my yum. And they think that just can't be right. You, so I'll use my own church as an example. The Catholic Church in uh, Vatican II and in, 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 in through the 1960s and 70s took the beautiful liturgy away and they replaced it with acoustic guitars and these insipid, awful hymns about eagles' wings and things like that. And, and then the church is emptied out. Surprise, surprise. But there has been a movement recently uh, a reform of the reform, to go back to that traditional practice. It's really embodied in, uh, in an older form. The priest will not always face the congregation or the parish. He might face away or he might, and you're all facing God together. I think that's what we're beginning to see. I'm, I'm very, very hopeful from, from everything I look around, especially because of the new media, because you can find Dennis Prager or Peterson or Banner or Clavin or whatever. Uh, I think we're, be, we're able to crack through this leftist tyranny of, uh, of pathetic mid-century thought. I think there, there's a, a glimmer of hope on the horizon. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, thank you for coming and thank you for your speech. Um, my question is specific to college campuses. How do you recommend engaging with people who won't even acknowledge some sort of fundamental principles or objective truth or even talk about religion? Or do you think there's another way to go about it or is it not worth our effort, effort at all? Thank you. I think you have to do it like they're children, because they behave like children. They wear genital hats and shriek and yell and interrupt people who are trying to have civilized conversations. And like children, they don't understand uh, when they are being incoherent or being illogical. For instance, in your example, they might deny objective truth and they say, there is no such thing as objective truth. And you could always say, how do you know that? How do you, uh, you, do, you just said something. Is that statement true or is that statement false? I would treat them like children. And I don't mean that in a, a way to punish them or anything. I just mean they're very uneducated and they're very uncultured. And a lot of them don't even know how people are supposed to behave in conversation. They don't even know the, about politeness or manners. They just weren't raised right, man. They don't have that old time religion. And so I would do it that way. And also with children, you don't smack them around and torture them, hopefully. You have patience with them and you, you want them to see the world clearly. You want them to, you, you have a vision of the world as it is and you want them to share that. So I, I would always do it that way. I wouldn't get too angry. Uh, you know, I gave this talk on the humorless left, but I ain't humorless. I'm having a great time. And I think if you're in politics and you're, <laughs> you're joyful and you can laugh at the stupid hats, you know, then I think you're doing it right. Thank you.
I uh, thank you for your speech. It's it's good and refreshing. I'm a Christian, so like this is something that I'm actually very passionate about, and I talk to a lot of friends about. And the big pushback that I get when I say things like when I talk about Christianity or Islam or Sharia law, like things like that, like uh, Bill Warner, I, I reference a lot of his stuff. I get a lot of pushback, and I, they kind of make the religions the same. Right. And they don't they don't necessarily understand that like they're they have completely different teachings. It's not just like they all carry the same universal morality. So like what advice would you give to kind of break that barrier? I mean, I've done the like actually going through the teachings and then I just got called a bigot and an Islamophobe, even though I'm like quoting the Quran or, or things like that. So like what kind of advice would you have to kind of break down that barrier and try and reach the middle ground? You were hate reading. You were hate reading scripture then. That oh that's how dare you. That's terrible. Yeah, there's this bizarre place where Jerry Seinfeld said he's not gonna uh, play college campuses anymore because the kids don't wanna laugh. They just want to call things racist and sexist. And it's the same. They don't want to learn about Islam or Christianity or any other religion for that matter. They just want to call you a bigot because their religion is politics. It's a real perversion of what we've been talking about all night. There's religion, and downstream there's culture, and downstream there's politics. But this awful materialism, this awful relativism, this awful postmodernism, use whatever ism you want here, instead of looking up in the culture worshiping what is of the cult, it looks down and it worships the politics. Uh, feminists did this in the 1960s and said, the political is personal, the personal is political. This, this worship of that, because everybody's got to serve somebody. So I, I would always begin from a position of humility. It, uh, you know, the least informed are usually the loudest. And so it's an important realization when you realize you don't know very much compared to other people. I, I would do it that way. I would, uh, I, I would ask them, sometimes I get asked about abortion. And they say, but it's not a life, and it's not a this, and it's not a that. I say, how sure are you? How sure? Because, oh, maybe it's not a morally dignified life. Maybe there's only a 5% chance. Are you willing to risk that? That's a million people a year that you're killing. Are you willing to take a 5% chance? I would approach it in that way and just ask questions. They'll stop sputtering at some point, or they'll walk away. <laughs> So uh, first of all, I, I really appreciate what you're doing because in the in the United States, I feel there there's not much that un unites people besides uh, religion because of our situation um, being a society of so many different cultures, and um, so it's really important first of all to have uh, to have a strong faith-based um, uh, society, uh, moral society. But when you say that when people when the left um, when what they do is too passive, when they try to protest, uh, like say Wall Street or that is too passive, and when the right say, uh, when they stand, what are they really standing for? Because anyone can stand. Uh, what do you suggest? Would you suggest like direct action against institutions which, uh, which actively oppose uh, faith-based society? Oh, uh, sure, I'm fine with that. I, yeah, I'm happy to, to fight the barbarians when they come clamoring at the mm -hmm. gates. But I'm actually saying something a little deeper that I don't think uh, people do, and I don't want to do that much, and it's just kind of gone away, which is actually participating in the institutions. There are a lot of people who now are realizing that, oh gosh, this divided politics and this divided culture is just miserable, and it's not even true. And yes, maybe, maybe we had it better before we destroyed Christianity. Oh, may yeah, maybe Christianity, that's the good one. And then they don't go to church. But you can't do that because it, we like to take ourselves out of our own bodies and say, oh, I'm just floating in the ether. I'm just this abstraction. I can just think. But that's not true. You're a person with a body who participates in things in time and space, and someday you're not going to be here anymore. And so I think we need to do those things. I think we need to go to the church. I think we need to talk to people on the street. I, I think it's, uh, we should pull away from being just keyboard warriors and uh, really talk to people, not intellectualize it or rationalize it so much, but really participate. Put your whole body into it. Put a little elbow grease into it. I think that would go a long way. Thank you. Hi. If you had to choose between Enlightenment values, Christian values, and Greek values, which would you choose? Well, luckily, Christian value, Christian value seems to do the whole thing because it unites uh, Jewish 
revelation with Greek reason. So that's pretty good for me. I'm, I'm, I would be quite pleased with, uh, if I had to pick only two doctors of the church to bring with me to a desert island, I would take St. Augustine and St. Thomas. And I, I think that comes together very nicely. The, the, I'm speaking broadly here, obviously. There are many Enlightenment thinkers and writers who I shouldn't be criticizing, and some who were trying to work through problems and it just didn't work out. But the experiment to try to remove value from God failed. It failed utterly. And the 20th century is the steaming, burning uh, ruins of that experiment. So I would, uh, I would push back a little further and try to analyze, hmm, where did the Enlightenment go wrong? How did we get to the guillotines? <laughs> Let's, how do we avoid that in the future? And, uh, and I would never neglect reason, and I would never neglect revelation. I think right now there's a culture of rationalism where people worship reason and they do it as irrationally as one possibly can. That scientistic culture that says, do you believe in science? You say, I believe it. You're talking a little weird, man. It kind of it sounds a little religious the way you do. you believe in global warming? Mea culpa, mea culpa. I need my carbon footprint. I need to buy my, I need to buy my carbon offset as my plenary indulgence or something. Uh, I, I, I hope that answers your question. Thank you. <clears throat> oh, sorry. Uh, thanks for coming. Uh, facts don't care about your feelings. Trademark Ben Shapiro, Ben Shapiro 2020. But um, I just have a question about that statement. Uh, if facts don't care about your feelings, how could you argue that being secular doesn't cut it? Like you said, being because secular. God is a fact. No follow-up questions. <laughs> uh, I'll expand on it a bit because it's a very good question. Uh, there are people who begin from the premise, but it's not a coherent premise, that the only thing that is real is that which I can see and touch. That's what's real, and anything else is just a fantasy. It's just a total imagination. And obviously that isn't true. I can't touch mathematics, but mathematics is true. I can't touch love, but love is obviously real. Uh, I can't touch uh, moral claims, but m morality is real. And so I think, uh, Part of the problem of the last 300 years or so is that we've so narrowly defined reality to say, only that which I can touch is real. They say, well, you're talking, aren't you? I say, yeah. You're using language, aren't you? Yeah. You're using your reason, yeah. Well, I can't, can I touch your reason? And I think it breaks down there. I think we're beginning to realize that uh, a God that's, that's all feelings uh, doesn't make a lot of sense, but God might be a fact. And he does care about your feelings, but he is, he's a fact too. Uh, hi. So you seem to be kind of generalizing the left as these sort of screaming lunatic, uh, which is feminist with I know, like vagina I've been vagina very restrained hat. tonight in my description. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, but I think it's kind of, it's not just unique to the left. It kind of affects the right as well, right? Like you could see, you know, videos online of uh, like pro-life uh, protesters or if you ask them like, well, why are you against abortion? And they'll just say, well, it's in the Bible, right? That's their justification for it. Is that um, true? Have you ever asked a pro-life demonstrator and they said it's in the Bible? I've seen interviews with, with people who are pro-life that have I'm a little used skeptical. that justification. <laughs> well, okay, but um, my point is, uh, you know, and you've got people like Ben Shapiro who can make like secular philosophical arguments against abortion, uh, even though he's religious. Why uh, would adherence to strict adherence to religious dogma um, instead of reason, which can be more easily argued against, be conducive to a, a civil and productive dialogue? There are no secular moral arguments because there's no argument for uh, one moral claim over another moral claim. You can't make a scientific argument for one of those. You have to make a philosophical or a theological argument for those things. So there are plenty of uh, scientific buttresses uh, on the question of abortion, for instance. There are plenty of good things we can say. For instance, a baby uh, that is born premature can survive outside the womb 26 weeks. So that's a baby. But a fetus will stay in the womb for 40 weeks. So we're saying that a 39-week-old fetus can be killed and is morally irrelevant, but a 26-year-old baby that has been born can survive and is morally relevant. That's not a very clear uh, moral dictum, is it? That doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So there are plenty of uh, reasons that we can uh, add that come from science as to why our moral claims are true, but you can't make a scientific argument that you shouldn't kill people. 
There's no scientific argument for that. So ultimately, uh, we all use reason, but we must use first principles and premises that we can't quite argue for most of the time. Uh, when it comes to the hysterical right, the immoral equivalence just isn't there. You don't see right-wing organizations shouting down leftist speakers and kicking them off campus and punching Charles Murray in the face and <laughs> causing the city of Berkeley to spend $600,000 to defend a five foot nine Orthodox Jew who just wants to tell you that facts don't care about your feelings. You don't see that happening, but you do see it on the left. You see it on the left because as much as the left likes to tout their own reason, they're very, very unreasonable. They shout and they shriek and they yell you down and they say, how dare you, and you can't talk if you're a straight, white, cisgendered male of whatever uh, ethnic background because, ah, uh, because, ah, uh, because, ah, uh, that's not a reasonable argument. That's just yelling and screaming. And uh, so I, I don't see the moral equivalence at all. And any caricature of a pro-lifer I don't think is fair. I, I was pro-choice. I don't use that phrase because it's ridiculous. But I, I supported abortion. I was convinced by a bioethicist over lunch that it didn't make a whole lot of sense, that most of the arguments for abortion that are made in books like Freakonomics and so on are really also arguments for killing young men in inner cities. All of the arguments keep cutting back and, and for killing the elderly and for killing the mentally deficient and really heinous arguments, hideous arguments. Uh, I think ultimately, to, to put a point on your question, if one follows reason to its logical conclusion, one has no choice but to believe in God. I think the arguments for God are much, much better than the, really the one argument against God that is at all convincing, which is the problem of pain and the problem of suffering in our world. And ultimately, I think even that observation is an argument for God. I'm nervous. Hello. My name is John. Don't be nervous. I'm very gentle. Just I'm very, Just I'm not like the Antifa with the clubs and everything. Oh, I know. That's why I came to see you. <laughs> it's, so, it's so nice seeing things like this around campus. It makes me so happy. Like, ooh, this is really happening. I got to be there. I wasn't going to be here. My rehearsal got canceled, so I'm so glad I could be here. Anyway, my question. What can people my age who, uh, I can only really speak for myself, who understand the importance of old-timey religion, um, but I feel like there's so much out there sometimes that I feel like I'm lost in like a sea of meaning sometimes. What, and I understand that we can like go to church and, and read the Bible and all that stuff. And I understand all that stuff and I, could, I should be more religious and I, and I accept all that stuff. But what well, can we- You have enough Catholic guilt. You're clearly on the way <laughs> there, I can tell. I'm actually Lutheran if you want to get real <laughs> into it. I was raised Lutheran, so. Um, what can we do as young folks to get back to that old-timey religion, action-wise, in our lives, meaning, and all that shindig? Thank you. The, yeah, that's an excellent question. The main stumbling block was brought up in the previous question as well, which is that we've been told, though not really explained why this is true, we've been told that it's unreasonable to believe in God, that religion is just some vestige of the past, and thank goodness we're free from those shackles, and God is dead and we've killed him, and you know, really, that's okay. We've been told that, and so there's this intellectual snobbishness, and people say, oh, you know, if I believe in God, then I won't be thought smart or sophisticated, and I won't look very nice at uh, cocktail parties. But that simply isn't true. The smartest people in the history of the world have believed in God, and they've believed in basically the same vision of God. So what I, I recommend for this culture, which is so uh, bullying, they, there is such intellectual bullying into atheism, incoherent intellectual bullying. What I recommend you do is read the great thinkers on Christianity, some of the great apologists, some of the great doctors of the church. You could read uh, C.S. Lewis, or you could read Chesterton, or you could read Owen Barfield, or you could read Hilaire Belloc. I, do you know that meme where it's like the brain and then the bigger brain and then the super brain and all? Yeah, that's kind of how I think. You know, it's like C.S. Lewis, G.K. Chesterton, you get to Hilaire Belloc. You know, I can't even take this anymore. I would do that because I think it will satisfy. I, I don't. I think there are many probably better ways into that uh, experience of faith and that experience of God. But I think that in our culture there is such a prejudice for intellectualizing things that I think we need to use that weakness of our culture against it, even on ourselves, and use that as an entry point to get into deeper levels of a relationship with God. 
I appreciate your memes. Thank you. <laughs> Follow your memes, kids. Follow your memes. I realize this is like great advice for the culture. Um, we're only taking two more questions, so the next two people in line. <laughs> Hi, thank you so much for coming. You don't actually seem that execrable, so that was well, a surprise. I mean, you haven't talked to me that much yet. <laughs> um, I was just wondering, you mentioned that uh, deep conversations are more important than small talk. Do you have any specific advice for how to invite people to have those deep conversations? Yeah, just do it. Just do it. A friend of mine from college no longer says, hey, how you doing? He says, what are you reading? And this is very, most people now would say, I don't know, Twitter, I don't know, reading Facebook or something. I'm looking at images on Instagram. Uh, one way to do it is you should read more. My pal Andrew Claven, very famously in his 20s, just decided to read every book. And he just read them all, you know, he just read them in his 20s. I've read like, you know, a millionth of all the books, he just read them all. That's one way to do it. Uh, but I would be unafraid to speak about real things. I had a conversation with a, a lefty acquaintance of mine. And there was a remarkable thing, which is that I was perfectly comfortable talking about what I think, and this person was very uncomfortable doing that. But this person kept asking very personal questions about my experiences, which is very rude. <laughs> One should not do that. Uh, and, but she, all she wanted to talk about was her feelings and her experiences. That's a byproduct of a culture that's very relativistic and very navel-gazing. So I would ignore that. It's very politically incorrect to talk about religion and politics and to talk about culture, which is really the, the middle ground between them. Do it anyway. Just do it. Don't have any fear. Take heart. You'll have a much better time <laughs> in, in life and in conversation. And, and it, I think, will help the culture. Thank you. Hi, thank you for coming. Um, do you believe that the rise in graying sexuality and transgenderism has anything to do with a uh, decline in Judeo-Christian values? Yeah, the rise in confusion certainly comes from a rise in confusion. I think basically uh, the Judeo-Christian values come from the God who says, I am that I am. Moses asks God, he says, who should I tell them that you are? And he says, I, tell them I am that I am. Christ says, Lost my microphone. There it is. Christ says, before Abraham was, I am. I am the essence of being. And so, when you connect your identity to I am, you know who you are. If you don't do that, when you disconnect that, you're left with a pathetic question, a, a really awful question that we should pity, which is, who am I? Who am I? And so we take on all of these minor attributes that are not our identity, that are ultimately unsatisfying for our identity. Teenagers do this. This is why I say you should treat the left like children, and I don't mean that to be mean, I mean it to be patient and hopefully grow them up a little bit, is you put on identities when you're a kid. So for you know, a little bit, I liked rock music, you know, and so I don't know what I, I played a lot of guitar and wore stupid rings or something. And then you, know, you like this, and, then, and we try on all of these different identities. I'm an Italian American, I'm a hyphenate, I'm a this, I'm this, that, or the other thing. All of those, all of those are ultimately unsatisfying. And so I, I don't know how much experimenting will need to happen, how much identity experimenting will need to happen, how much spiraling into the subjective and endless self-identity needs to happen before we realize that the only gratifying identity is when we pull it right out of ourselves and put it at the eternal and at the infinite and at the metaphysical. Thank you, Michael, for those uh, really thoughtful comments. Um, and I th thank you all for attending tonight's event. As I stated earlier, if you brought a copy of Michael's book with you, feel free to stay after so he can sign it. My really thoughtful book. Your really, thought really thoughtful book. Yes, your very thoughtful right, book, yeah. yes. For everyone else, I ask that you please find your way to the nearest exit as this space is reserved for another event at this time. Thank you. Thank you so much.